Hi, and welcome to a board wrap-up for the month of October 2014. Our guest, of course, is Superintendent Dr. David Pennington, and the Board of Education meeting comes on fall break as well. We hope everybody has a great fall break. And uh, Superintendent, I guess uh, the first place to start is uh, that we are going to have some elections in February for our board members. Right. We have two board seats that are open. Um, the seat that is held by Don Newsom um, is uh, is part is a regular election cycle. Uh, it's a five-year term. The person um, who uh, who um, who is elected to that re area will take their oath of office in March of 2015 and serve until 2020. Uh, but boy, it sounds a long way away, doesn't it? It does, but it, it'll be here before it'll we know be here it. Before you know it. And then the other term is the seat that uh, was held by Dr. Ron Hartman, and Dr. Hartman passed away last year, and the board, board appointed Marvin Clark into that position, and uh, at this time, it looks like Marvin is not going to run again, and so uh, not going to run to fill that seat. Marvin's a long, has been a long time member of the Punk City Board of Education, and, and of course, you don't ever know what anybody's going to do until the December date rolls around, but the person who is elected to that seat will have two years. Uh, they'll serve until February of 2017. So it's a short, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a short time in office. Uh, I'm still hopeful that Marvin will change his mind. Marvin uh, has uh, lots of experience in the district, has been a board member for a long time, and uh, has a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And, and uh, But uh, again, he's, you know, to, I mean, I understand he's been on the board before. He He's kind of done his time and, and has other things. You know, his, his children, grandchildren all live outside of the district, outside of the area. And so, um, you know, he has other other things that are on his, his attention. The, again, the first seat is Don Newsom, And, you know, Don's been a member of the board for a long time and has been very steady and solid. And, um, you know, my hope is that, that Don will decide to remain on the board. Um, and uh, because uh, he has... He just has lots of experience and, and is not only well respected by, I think, the rest of the board in this community, but is uh, respected across the state because of what he knows about, um, about schools and, and, uh, and what we do and what our long-term plans are and those kinds of things. So, you know, we'll see what happens. It's always interesting. Uh, one thing that is dramatically different uh, this time around is that this past uh, legislative session, uh, the legislature changed the rules and now individuals who run for the Board of Education, uh, like people who run for the state legislature, have to file financial disclosure forms. And so uh, they have to submit copies of tax returns and other official documents uh, before, they can, uh, before they can run for the board and those documents become public record. So, uh, you know, I'm not really sure why the legislature did that. Um, personally, I, I think it's a a bad idea. I think it will discourage some people from seeking uh, a board position, um, and I, and I think it was just a little bit of overreach for a for a position that it's not. It doesn't pay anything. Uh, it, it's it's just volunteering your time. Um, you know, I think there's a difference between somebody who runs for office and 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 they get paid to do that job, and they, you know, potentially control billions of dollars in state revenue as opposed to uh, to somebody who's serving on a board of education that uh, at the end of the day, whenever you look at how school budgets work um, and all the mandates we have to fulfill, uh, there may be, you know, 10% of our budget that they really have any control over. So um, I just thought it was interesting and, and I, I, my, I would expect that we're going to see less a smaller number of people file for school board races this Christmas than or this December we've ever had before. And I also think probably there'll be some movement this next session to make some changes in that legislation. Uh, filing period, December, uh, early December, and then the election the second Tuesday of February. Uh, like many uh, watching the board meeting last night, Barbara Cusick, Dr. Cusick had a very interesting program and presentation on testing scores in Ponca City. You know, we went over our test results, and, uh, you know, that's, we do this this time every year. It's part of the frustration of state assessment in, in the fact that we took the test in the spring, 
and it's really not until the first of the next school year that you get your data where it's firm and you know it's right. Um, and then by that time, you know, you're, you're really already into the school year. You've already made your classroom assignments. You've already, you've already done so much that the data is basically irrelevant other than to kind of say, this is how we did. It's kind of like a, like a coach who, you know, you're a basketball coach and you finish basketball season in March and then the next fall you go to uh, you go to the to the Rotary Club to talk about your basketball team, and you talk about last year's record. Well, that's old news, and uh, and what you did last year doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on what you're going to do this year. Um, so what did what did the test results show us? Well, it showed us that we're basically in all in reading and math, uh, we're kind of staying even. Uh, we had a little dip in the overall number of students who were proficient in reading and math, but the group of student scores that were reported were different than the students, group of student scores that were reported in the past. It's one of the frustrations with state assessment. You know, it, it's, it never, it's not consistent over time. We've been doing this since the mid-1990s, you know. And uh, in, a, in a system that made sense, I would be able to go look and see where our students were academically in, in 1995 and compare it to where we are in 2015. But I can't do that because uh, how we're tested has changed. Uh, uh, who's tested has changed. Uh, how you determine proficiencies levels has changed. So there's no consistency. I can't look and say that this percentage of students were proficient now and this many students were proficient 10 years ago and make any kind of valid correlation because all the, the, the parts of testing that make your, your results uh, scalable to future years or past years has all been obliterated by the mess that is state assessment. So, uh, so, so what's different this year? Well, the, the main thing that's different is that for the first time, um, all students who are enrolled in special education courses, except for those students who take a portfolio assessment, well, I can't even say that, even the portfolios, all students who are in state, who take, all students, we assess everybody, all those kids, uh, all special ed students, their scores for the first time, all their scores were included in our overall proficiency rates. And for students who do not take a portfolio assessment, they took the exact same test everybody else did. So in the past, maybe a student in a special ed program, if the special ed team thought that a student needed to take a modified assessment, then maybe they would have taken the state reading test, but maybe uh, uh, their test would have been the same question as other students, but instead of having four choices uh, to decide from to, to, to uh, select the correct answer, maybe they only had three choices. Or uh, maybe where a regular ed student would have had a 36 question test, uh, some special ed students may have had a 15 question test. Now, there were some modifications in there. Uh, and they did away with those this last year. And so the result of that was is that across the state, everybody's proficiency rates went down, which you would expect. Uh, there's a reason why students who are in special education classes during the regular school year have their curriculum modified. Now, you know, when people hear the word modified, they immediately think that it's easier or it's less uh, less rigor. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, you're trying to teach the same standards. You just do it in a different way. And then you make modifications for those students based upon their disability. So, you know, it gets kind of complicated. The bottom line is our scores dropped a little bit. Uh, we, we believe that that dip is because of the uh, special ed students' scores being counted in with everybody else, um, um, and you know that's fine. I mean, if that's what, and I, I don't, I'm not really 
I mean, there's a part of me that's a little bit opposed to that. I don't think that's fair to special ed kids, but, you know, um, we can live with that, and we believe that over time we'll be able to, to um, you know, adjust the focus of our instruction and that we'll see those scores go up. Not to uh, get too far away from the Board of Education meeting, but I do have a question about uh, testing uh, in schools across the state because, as we all know, uh, our superintendent of schools is, is out, Barisi, and there will be a change in leadership there. Do you expect that the new superintendent, whether it be um, uh, the lady from Tulsa, Hoffmeister. Mr. Ho Ms. Hoffmeister or Mr. Cox, yeah. uh, do you expect that when they hit the ground, they're going to hit the ground running and we're going to see a different way of testing students for the second half of the school year? No, and, and here's the reason why. Uh, the, the, type of the type of assessment that we give in the spring is what testing uh, folks call a summative assessment, okay? Uh, and that summative assess assessment is what is mandated by federal law, okay? So we're still going to take a summative assessment. Um, and, uh, and, and, I don't, and I don't see, now I think eventually that'll change. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that, that when or if the federal government gets around to reauthorizing uh, ESEA, and, and ESEA is the Elementary and Secondary School Act, it is the federal law that, that guides federal education policy. Most of us today know that as no child left behind. Uh, when, when they, and, and again, you know, I've, I've talked about this before, but what happens with, with most federal legislation is that Congress passes a law, especially if it's for uh, environmental, environmental issues, banking rules, uh, education policy, health care policy, all those kind of major policy things. Uh, <clears throat> they pass a law, then they, then they update it. Okay, that update is called reauthorization. Typically, they reauthorize federal programs within a five to seven year time period. So they, they, they pass a law, uh, they, then they, you know, hear everybody talk about what they think's wrong with it, and everybody talk about what we ought to do to make it better. They come back together, and then they make changes in that. And that process is called reauthorization. ESEA, or what was dubbed, named No Child Left Behind in 2002, was supposed to be reauthorized in 2008. And so we are now uh, six years out on reauthorization. Um, you know, my, my opinion is it'll probably be after the 2016 election before it gets reauthorized. So we're, we're very likely to go 10 years be between reauthorizations, and that's just never happened before. But until we get that reauthorization, um, testing is probably going to look a lot like it looks right now, which will be a summative assessment. Um, and then, now, there could be some slight modifications. Uh, you know, we could maybe go to a, an online system that gets the test results back quicker. Um, we could uh, do, have a, what we probably, the, the main thing we need to do, in my opinion, is to, you know, make a commitment to stabilize what we do. Uh, this is what we're going to assess. This is how we're going to do it. And we're not going to monkey with it. We're not going to change cut scores. We're not going to change standards. We're going to keep this in place for, um, 10 years or so, so we have some comparative data. Uh, the, uh, the biggest challenge we have is we are, you know, I mean, we're halfway through the, you know, a quarter of the way through the school year, and we don't know what the standards are that we're going to assess kids on in the spring because of the legislature's decision to uh, repeal Common Core, and even though we all assume it's going to be based on past standards, which were the standards that were in place before uh, the, before Common Core. We don't really have an official word on that because the State Department of Education is just a mess. I mean, it's just a mess. It's just a mess because the State Board 
um, and the state superintendent are in conflict with each other. Uh, school people are concerned about uh, Secretary Barisi uh, having the authority to create new standards or have a, have a say so because, I mean, if you listen to her comments at the, end of, at the at last election, she's bitter about what happened. And uh, we're a little concerned that if she were in control, she would establish a testing policy that would punish schools. I mean, and you know, when you control the test, you can do that. I mean, you, all of us can remember being in a classroom where you had a teacher who, who wrote test questions that were so hard that you couldn't pass the test. Okay, and we've also had teachers who wrote test questions so easy that, you know, you, you could never pick up a book, you could never study anything, and you could pass the test. So the person who writes the test has a great deal of control of what the outcome is going to be. And so, uh, and, and, you, and you know, now, even though she doesn't technically write the test, she is the one that picks a test vendor. She is the one that gives directions to the test vendor about what, how we want the question structured, what we want them to be like. So, you know, there's just, right now, and until January, there's just going to be a lot of distrust uh, in the, uh, at what goes on at the State Department. And, you know, last last board meeting she lashed out at one of her board members, so I just can't imagine that's a pleasant atmosphere right now for anybody. As we record our program today, today is the day that the Education Committee is meeting at Capitol Hill uh, for their Education Committee meeting. Why don't they just wait until this is all done before they make any decisions? Well, that, that's what the State Board has done. I mean, all they've done since the election is do things that they have to do right okay. now. They, they've been, you know, uh, uh, Superintendent Barisi has asked them to approve several um, pieces of policy to move the, the standards assess, standard selection process forward. They've turned her down at every step of the way. Uh, they understand that whatever probably happens now, they're going to have to redo in January anyway. Mm -hmm. So I do it. The problem with all that is uh, it just puts, it puts, whoever that next state superintendent is going to walk in in January, and they're going to have to immediately get the process started to select a test vendor who's going to give tests in the spring. In a rational world, what you would say is, we're not assessing this year. Mm -hmm. We're in a mess. Right. You know, we're not going to assess this year. We're just going to stop where we are. We're going to take our time. We're going to get it right. But we have these federal requirements that require us to assess. So, you know, it's just, unfortunately, you know, it's a mess. And I think that there, you know, again, you could probably get some people in a room and maybe bring some officials in from the U.S. Department of Education, and maybe you could come up with an agreement that would be kind of a, a stopgap kind of thing. Maybe we, you know, there are assessments that are pre, like the, like the Iowa Test of Basic Skills is a test that most people took sometime during their school career. It's a traditional standardized test. Those tests are on the shelf right now. You could go purchase those tests and you could give them in the state of Oklahoma. That's what we did when we first started to develop the test we have now. We gave some packaged standardized tests beforehand. Now, are they best assessments? Are they, you know, they're probably not really what we want to do right now. But again, they're an assessment. We could do it. Excuse me, and maybe we, if the feds would agree, we could use those for accountability purpose for a couple of years until we get this right. It might be even be cheaper than trying to hire a testing company because the, the company that we would be most likely to work with because they've done our state assessment for the last couple of years is McGraw Hill, and McGraw Hill doesn't want anything to do with Oklahoma. And, you know, they, we beat them up for the problems they had with assessment, and they had problems last year. Uh, and they just basically said, we're done, you know, we're walking away. And uh, so if they do come back on board, I'm sure they're going to charge us an arm and a leg. So, uh, so it, it, it's just a problem, you know. Uh, we created it. You know, the legislature, uh, the, the, I understand the legislature's desire to back out of Common Core, okay. Uh, there were lots of reasons for that. There was, there, you, had, you had some very conservative Oklahomans who were very concerned about Common Core and this idea of a national 
curriculum, which is basically what Common Core was going to be. I personally don't think that's a bad idea, but there are people that do. You had teachers who were unhappy with Common Core, with the assessment part of Common Core, because it, it, we were going to use Common Core assessments as part of teacher evaluation. We knew that Common Core assessments were going to be more difficult than anything we've ever done before. So you knew that at the beginning, student scores were going to drop. Well, again, you know, we know student scores are going to drop. You're going to make these scores a part of my evaluation. My evaluation is going to be bad because that's, that's crazy. Parents were upset because we were going to use test scores and teachers' evaluation. It was going to, in turn, put more pressure on students where students were going to, I mean, they're under enough pressure right now. We were really going to ratchet that pressure up. I mean, again, you think about it. If your job depended upon a young person doing whatever it is, you know, uh, and you're under the direct supervision of that young person, you're probably going to put more pressure on that young person to perform at a higher level. And I don't think parents want that. They want teachers to teach their children give them the best education they can, and they want those teachers to love those kids. That's what parents want. You know, they want them to be accountable, they want them to learn, but they don't want somebody looking at a student and saying, that student is going to either make my evaluation better, or that student may cause me to lose my job because they're not going to perform on an assessment. That's, that's, that's not what we want. So you had that coalition that gathered together and so they, and I understand the legislature decision, but what they could have done is they could have said that Common Core is going to go away and we will no longer use the Common Core state standards in pick a year. 2016, 2017, we'll continue operating under the current system and State Department, you've got two years to come up with new standards. But they chose to Common Core is going away, and we're stopping all of it right now. And that's just throwing us into a mess. And, and uh, you know, it's just going to be uh, difficult uh, for us for the next couple of years. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how you're going to get, I don't know how they're going to get any clarity and going to work through this. Because the problem is, is the folks who have worked for the State Department for the last four or five years in assessment, in testing, those people are all leaving the State Department because they probably correctly believe that whoever the next state superintendent is is going to clean house and bring in an entire new group of people to work inside that agency. Well, whoever the new superintendent will be, and by this time next month when we record our program, we'll know, don't you feel like that there's a lot of trust that has to be regained by that state position? Listen, they have got a huge job. Um, uh, they have got to not only establish trust with, with teachers and administrators, they have to establish trust with the legislature, they've got to establish trust with the business community, and they have to establish tr trust with the executive branch of state government. So they've got to use job. And I want to talk about that a little bit, Phil. I want to talk about the two candidates. Sure. Uh, uh, I happen to know uh, Joy Hoffmeister and John Cox both very well. They are both great people, okay? Um, they are both uh, individuals who are committed to children, and they are committed to public education. And uh, that's a big deal for me, uh, because in the last few years, we've had people who, who they, 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 they wanna talk around public education, you know, over 97% of the students, school-age students in Oklahoma, attend public schools. Uh, it is ridiculous to me that anybody in state government would want to attempt to shift those enrollment numbers to something else. Um, and that's what we've been through for the last several years. Uh, whether it was legislatures trying, leg, remember the legislature trying to pass legislation to provide either tax credits or vouchers for children's to kids to attend private schools, whether it's uh, in whatever, whatever the schemes are, this is a and really the, the country as a whole. I think ninety five percent of the kids in the nation go to public schools, and so we we have to have a laser like focus 
on improving public education in Oklahoma. And we're not going to do that by, by messing around out here in the weeds with all these schemes. We've got to be focused on our public schools. And John Cox and Joy Hoffmeister are both public school advocates. Um, they are both good people. Um, and, they, and the thing I like about both of them is they both listen. You know, if uh, I've had an opportunity for the last uh, seven or eight months to have lots of conversations with Joy Hoffmeister. I don't think it's any secret to anybody that I, I, I changed my registration so to, I, to, to vote in the Republican primary, and I did that, and I supported Joy Hoffmeister in that race. When I started off with that, it was just because she was not Janet Barisi. I'll be mm -hmm. bluntly honest. But over the last seven or eight months, I've had an opportunity to spend lots of time and have lots of conversations with Joy Hoffmeister. Uh, she, uh, you know, we don't agree on everything, okay? Um, but she is passionate about kids. She's passionate about public schools. And she's passionate about having a State Department of Education that operates in a way that it serves the schools and the children of the state of Oklahoma, um, which is a huge plus. John Cox is a superintendent. John, like all of us, has had to deal with the dysfunction that's existed in the State Department for the last four years. Obviously, John's committed to kids. Uh, you know, uh, people have asked me about the race, and you know what I've told everybody is, I don't listen. I think whatever, whichever way you go on this, both both people are good choices. Um, and it, and uh, if John Cox is our next state superintendent, I'll I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. You know. If, uh, if Joy Hoffmeister as an next state superintendent, I'll be happy. The, the way I s see the race and the reason that, that I still support Joy Hoffmeister is because we're going to have a Republican legislature. Okay, That's going to happen. We are in such crisis right now in this state, we, we just can't afford a situation where we have a Republican legislature and a state superintendent that they're fighting with on everything. Okay. Now that's not, I mean, I don't know that, but, but I look, I know partisan politics and I know what's happened in other Republican states whose state superintendent has lost the election. Uh, what's interesting about this whole thing, if you look at the people who were Janet Barisi's peers, when she came into office, she immediately aligned herself with Jeb Bush's Foundation for Education Excellence. And that was uh, Superintendent Barisi, uh, the State Superintendent in Maine, State Superintendent in Indiana, State Superintendent in Rhode Island, State Superintendent in Florida, and then eventually the State Superintendent in Mexico and Arizona got into that mix. I think West Virginia was in there too. Of all those folks, the only two that may be in office next November, after the November elections, are the superintendent of Rhode Island and the superintendent of New Mexico. The rest of them have either, either lost their primary election or they lost in the general election. Uh, because the, the policies that they have advocated for have turned out to be extremely unpopular with the peoples in the people in the states where they have worked. The closest the closest example to us is Indiana. And in Indiana, what happened is in 2012 they elected a school teacher to be state superintendent. Okay. What has happened since then is basically the Indiana legislature has created almost a separate state board of education and a separate state superintendent and they and they 
you know, when you've got this constitutional battle in Indiana over, over school policy, uh, you know, my opinion, it rests with the state superintendent. But we can't afford that kind of a fight here. You know, we just can't do that. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, so for my opinion, Joy Hoffmeister gives us the best chance to hit the ground running and get things done. That's not to say that John can't work with the legislature. John's a, a great person. Um, and, and, you know, I think probably will work with them well. But if you kind of, you know, I thought it was interesting what you've seen yesterday uh, two of the leaders in the House of Representatives who are Republicans have, have come out publicly questioning some things about John. Now, is it political mudslinging? Absolutely. Um, probably, in my opinion, qualifies as dirty politics. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of shows you already what I think the mindset would probably be if we end up with a Democrat in that spot. If the legislature were going to be more balanced, if it were a Republican majority with a strong Democratic minority, it may not be such a big deal. But, you know, Democrats are getting pretty hard to find in Oklahoma City. And until that tide turns, you know, uh, we'll see. Now, the, the wild card in that is, is the governor's race. Uh, because if something were to happen and Joe Dorman were to pull an upset, now you have you could have a Democratic governor, a Democratic state superintendent of schools, which sets up an interesting uh, issue because when Barisi got into power, the Republicans changed the way we do the State Board of Education. Used to, state board members were appointed by the governor. They served <clears throat> five-year terms, and their offices rotated so that you'd appoint a new school board member every year, and when, when you had a new person elected governor, they would have an appointment every year for the time they were in office. Well, you people may remember in January of 2011, the very first state school board meeting, kind of like the board meeting we had last month, we had this uh, just brouhaha between Barisi and the state board. She went back and made this big deal about their you know, they're, they're not going to work in their time in my hands. I can't get anything done. I've been elected to bring change. Looking back on it, I think she staged all this. She picked a fight. And so the legislature came in and passed legislation that eliminated the, ten, the term of office for board members and made, those, and made it so that every governor, as soon as they come into office, they get to appoint an entire new state board. Now, they have to be approved by the state Senate. So we're going to, if Dorman wins this election, we're going to have a new state board appointed by a Democrat that has to get through a Republican. So, I mean, it, I mean we've just got so many things here that, that just, you know, I mean, it may be years before we get out of this mess. Uh, so, uh, and I, you know, the polls I see, I think Dorman's got a real shot. He, he does, but... I think the point is, is education may be on that, on that first Tuesday in November of all the decisions that Oklahomans make, education, when it comes down to it, might be the most greatly affected. Well, it will be. And I think what's interesting is I think if you look at, at, uh, at what's, you know, why is the governor not maybe as popular as she had been in years past, I think it's education. Mm -hmm. I think that she alienated a lot of the public when she vetoed the third grade retention bill. That's been awful hard, you know, hard for her to explain. And I think that she also alienated people on the Common Core bill. She was a strong advocate for Common Core, and and then and then she took a very long time before she decided to veto that bill. And when she vetoed the bill, you know, she made the the opponents of Common Core mad because they didn't like how long she waited. And then for those of us that have worked very hard to put com to do the Common Core transition into our schools, all the time and effort we put in, all the work that teachers have made to make that transition, everything they did to get their classrooms ready, for those people it just felt like a slap in the face. And uh, and and you know, I mean, she was really in a tough political position, and and uh, so I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens in November. Um, you know, uh, if you'd have told me at this time last year that that Joe Dorman had a chance to be the next governor of Oklahoma, I'd have told you that there was absolutely no way that would happen. 
but uh, you know, uh, J Joe has always been a strong advocate for public schools. You know, there's never been any doubt where Joe stands. And the other thing that, that's made Dorman popular, people may remember that right after the Moore tornado, he became, he very actively looked for ways to build tornado shelters in every school in the state. He first wanted to take the franchise tax and direct that to uh, the construction of shelters. And when there got to be some questions about that, then he advocated for a statewide bond issue uh, that, to build shelters for schools. And, and so, you know, uh, it'll be interesting. They're both Oklahoma State grads. So, uh, you, know, you know, we're going to see some pistols firing on November 4th. We just don't know if there'll be Democratic pistols or Republican pistols. Absolutely. Uh, in conclusion, <laughs> anything else about the meeting or anything that uh, you wanted to uh, deliver before we end our program? Just we've had a great first nine weeks. Uh, you know, we're, uh, you, know, the, you know, Phil, you've, I, something I want to just kind of bring out. You know, we've had a great fall sports season. You know, our girls softball team uh, was the best team we've had in years here. And unfortunately, you know, we had an injury to our best player at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, uh, you just, those things happen. You hate them when they happen. Uh, but I, but I really uh, want to congratulate uh, the uh, the softball team on the season they had. Um, our community softball is a sport that get a lot of attention, and I and I think that probably a, a lot of our folks and I put myself in that group who, for various reasons, couldn't get out to see a ball game at home this year, that we missed a, a special opportunity. But what Coach Freeman's done with our softball program the last several years, you know. We are, we, we are now a contender in softball. You know, we haven't cracked through that upper level yet, but boy, we're right there. Uh, and our football team has been so much better, has been so much more competitive, has been in every ball game. You know, we've, we have played the hardest part of our schedule. Uh, we really now have, I think, the teams we play now from this point on are teams that we're very even with from a, from a, a, uh, an ability standpoint. Now, the difference is we're going to play a Sand Springs team this week that uh, has lots of momentum because, you know, they've won lots of games. I think, if, I think if the schedules were reversed, I think our records would look a lot alike, you know, than where we are right now. And we'd be, we'd be you know, 4-2 and two or 5-1 and one if we'd have had their schedule. So I hope people will come out uh, Thursday night and support the Wildcats and support them for the rest of the season. You know, we're still in the hunt for a playoff spot in this new alignment. And if we can get to the playoffs, if you kind of look at that other bracket, you know, if you look at the success Enid's had over there already, it makes me think that, uh, that, that we, could be, we could match up well with whoever we might catch in that western bracket. So, you know, we need to play better. It would be nice to get a win. The split, <clears throat> split certainly kept a lot of teams uh, in the fight later in the season, right. didn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good to see you. Have a great fall break. You have a great fall break as well. For Chris Adams behind the cameras and for Dr. Pennington, I'm Phil Turney.